The Senate spending scandal has morphed from allegations of inappropriate spending to an attack at the heart of the Harper Conservatives' credibility. Joining us now to discuss the political fallout of this controversy in the nation's capital, there's John Ibbotson. He's chief political writer with The Globe and Mail. And John, it's always a delight to have you on the program. Thanks for coming back on. Hey, Steve. Okay, before we focus on the latest, I want to start by asking you this. How long have you been covering politics in this country? Since 1988. Okay, 25 years. Have you ever seen a week like we've just had? Well, there were, there were times during the sponsorship scandal uh, when things were this crazy. Um, but in tr up here in Ottawa, in terms of the Harper government, no, there's never been a week like this. Well, n n never mind. I'm talking about all three levels of government. You've got something scandalous happening at all three levels of government right now in the country, which to mo I can't recall another time, which is why I'm asking you. No, you're absolutely right. You're, if you fold Rob Ford in there and the stuff that's going on in the provinces, um, actually, now that I think of it, it, things were also very hairy during the, uh, the week when the government almost fell in 2008. But uh, we live in interesting times, as they say. Which is good for your business and mine. So let's continue on, <laughs> shall we? Uh, the latest with the Senate expenses controversy. <clears throat> a report by a Senate committee has looked at Mike Duffy's expenses, the senator sort of from Prince Edward Island. And apparently we have learned that those records were edited. What can you tell us about that? Well, there are various and conflicting views. Uh, what we know is this. We know that uh, Mr. Duffy's quest, uh, expenses were under serious question. We know there was an audit of those expenses. We know that Nigel Wright, who was the chief of staff to Stephen Harper, decided that he would use his own funds in order to pay off uh, Mr. Duffy's expenses. We know that, uh, that subsequent to that, the uh, Senate committee that was looking at those expenses uh, toned down the final report. They didn't, I don't, I don't uh, agree with the word whitewash, which some people are using, because if you actually look at the final report, it's pretty clear that the auditors think that Mr. Duffy uh, inappropriately expensed some items. But the language wasn't as harsh as it, as it might have been. We have heard that two conservative senators, very senior people who know the prime minister well, <laughs> were involved in, okay, you don't like the word whitewashing, let's just use the word editing, which is more neutral. Do we know what they took out? They took out essentially the harshness of the language. The, the Deloitte report uh, in its final version uh, pretty clearly states that, uh, it, that there's real reason to question whether Mr. Duffy's expenses uh, were appropriately expensed. Uh, the original version of the report is more emphatic in its statement. The government's defense, by the way, of this is that since uh, the, the money had already been paid back, there was no point in piling on, as it were. But that isn't in the least uh, helping the government in what, as we both agree, is a miserable week. Do you find that an acceptable explanation? I find that the real, look, I, for me, the real question is not whether or not, w whether the original report uh, was more harshly worded than the final report. I accept the explanation that the government, uh, or the chief of staff, uh, paid off Senator Duffy's expenses, and because those expenses were paid off, the, re the report's language wasn't as harsh as it might have been. The far more important and inter interesting question is, what on earth was the chief of staff doing, interfering in the process by way of writing a personal check to take care of those expenses? Why did he decide to do that? Did he just have a deep personal fondness for the senator, a sense of obligation? Um, was he worried that this was going to escalate into something uh, far more serious for the government than he was hoping to short circuit it? I don't think if we step back for the, for the average voter, the average viewer, the question of which wording was used in the final report is the question. The real question is what was going on inside the prime minister's office that they decided to intervene in, in order to make this problem go away. That I think for the, for the average uh, you know, voter in the street. Is, is the real head scratcher and the one that has people uh, rightly very seriously upset with what the government was doing. Well, the two explanations you just gave are two explanations that have emerged uh, as speculation since, of course, Nigel Wright isn't speaking yet. Do you <coughs> find either or both of those explanations plausible? I'll be honest with you, Stephen. I don't know what is plausible right now. I, I, I know this. Uh, I've had uh, a number of conversations in the last couple of days with senior people inside the government. Senior people inside this government are very confused and very upset as to what was going on. Uh, they don't know what Nigel Wright, uh, they don't know why Nigel Wright did what he did. Uh, they haven't talked to him, he hasn't talked to them. 
They uh, believe that the Prime Minister was not informed, did not know what was going on. He is beyond angry. He said uh, in Peru yesterday that he was angry and upset. He's beyond angry and upset, apparently. He's, ab he's absolutely furious with what is happening. There is considerable confusion over um, what paper trail exists, if any. You'll notice, for example, that uh, Foreign Minister John Baird, uh, who's been answering questions in the House in the Prime Minister's absence, has been saying that the government is not aware of any documents surrounding this. That's very careful wording because they don't know if there are documents surrounding this and, and what those documents are and where those documents are located and who has them. Uh, this is no defense of the government, but it seems to me that, uh, that within the government itself, there is a deep sense of confusion over exactly what happens. They are, in their own sense, in, in many ways, as flummoxed um, as the rest of us are, and, and, and rightly very concerned about the damage this could do to them. Okay, John, our Friday program tends to be a bit of a week in review, so I do want to go through the Prime Minister's reaction to all of this as it emerged over the course of the week. We know that he spoke before caucus and in quite extraordinary and unusual fashion allowed the cameras and journalists to come in and record his comments to his caucus. Uh, I think the reviews on that seem to be unanimous in that it was a tone deaf, not very helpful performance. He then went further in Peru at his press conference with his Peruvian counterpart, went further saying, I'm sorry, I'm angry, I'm unhappy, I'm frustrated, etc." Do you think with that with that added mea culpa, if I can put it that way, that the Prime Minister has done everything he needs to do so far to deal with this? I don't think so. Uh, I was one of those who thought that his performance uh, before caucus was completely inadequate. I, I believe I, the line I used in the analysis was, it's not enough, it's not even the beginning of enough. Um, I think that the Prime Minister should hold a press conference that doesn't have a time limit on it. He, for one thing, he's pretty good at them. Uh, he doesn't like the press very much. He doesn't like doing press conferences. But whenever he does hold them, he tends to perform well. But he needs to sit down and let the media have the parliamentary press gallery, ask him everything that they want to ask, and give an answer to, to the extent that he's able to, to every one of those questions. I think unless and until he does that, the what did the prime minister know and when did he know it question will always hang out there. My understanding is um, and actually this is something I'm going to be writing for the Globe. Uh, my understanding is the reason they're not doing it is, again, they're not sure uh, what comes next. They don't know uh, ex exactly what the full nature of the problem is and they're reluctant to let the Prime Minister uh, go out there and say what he says only to discover later that there's new information that he himself was not aware of. That's their explanation for it. But nonetheless, th this scandal is doing tremendous damage to the credibility of the Prime Minister, and he only, only is making it worse uh, by not confronting it head on. Well, you've taken us nicely to where I wanted to go next, which is, of course, this Prime Minister got elected uh, in 2006 to form a government in part in response to the sponsorship scandal in Quebec and put us in, we're the guys who are going to clean up the mess left behind by the Liberals. What does the events of the past week, or a little longer than week, uh, do to Mr. Clean, as it were? Uh, it damages, um, dangerously damages uh, that credibility. Um, we, we, we mentioned at the top of the show about the, uh, the, the crisis in, the, uh, in December of 2008 when the opposition parties almost combined to bring down uh, the government and that was the worst week Stephen Harper had ever had. In some ways, this is a worst week. It's not because the government is in any danger of falling or he isn't going to be forced out of office. It's worse because back then in 2008, people who supported the Conservative Party stayed with him. Uh, they were outraged at what the opposition was trying to do. They thought it was illegitimate. A whole lot of people, even people who didn't vote Conservative, thought it was illegitimate. In this case, core Conservative supporters, the people who stand by Stephen Harper, are the ones who are angriest. Because you're right, the Conservatives were supposed to come in here and clean up the Stygian mess. Um, and if you were a Conservative supporter, you could say, through the Accountability Act and through other measures, they had done a pretty good job. The government had avoided this kind of scandal nigh on seven years. But now you have a crisis in which the Prime Minister's own credibility is at stake. His own uh, reputation uh, and, his, and that of his office for you know, being on the up and up. You may find that they're secretive, you might find that they're arrogant, you might find that they're uh, you know, undemocratic, but, but not corrupt. And it, there, there is a danger that the perception could entrench that Nigel Wright, by his actions, involved the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister's office in a cover-up 
That speaks to corruption. That damages the brand in a way nothing that has happened in the course of the last seven years damages the brand. Well, let me follow up on that because some might say this is one bad week in, a, you know, in the history of a seven-year life of a government. There will be others who will say, wait a sec, don't forget about tens of millions of dollars for gazebos during the G8 up in Muskoka. Don't forget about Bev Oda, the cabinet minister, ordering $9 glasses of orange juice and switching to multi-hundred dollars worth of hotel rooms and limousines and this kind of thing. And they will say, this is a pattern. Are you prepared yet to say that this government is now demonstrating a pattern of, well, fill in the blank. Use the word you want. I don't want to say corruption, but maybe it's recklessness or inattention to detail or call it what you will. Uh, I wouldn't say that there's a pattern. Well, no, I would say that there's a breach. Uh, there have been scandals and crises and, and contretemps and imbroglios and what have you through the course of this government, as with every government. There's been the $16 orange juice. Uh, there was the, the, the gazebo. Through it all, however, there was a broad sense of trust in the government itself. Uh, the, the polls showed that Mr. Harper's leadership numbers, his trust index, depending on what polling firm you were looking at, always outperformed those of other leaders. Even before this, uh, this scandal broke, however, uh, he, was he found himself in tough competition with the new liberal leader, Justin Trudeau. And now, through these actions, through the actions of the senators, and, and more important, through the actions of his former chief of staff, the trust and confidence in, in, him in he himself um, is being questioned. So I don't see this in the same light as um, Minister Bernier leaving documents in his girlfriend's apartment or Bev Oda. Um, you know, expensing her orange juice or, or even uh, the, the, the uh, contratemps overspending on the G20. This is different. It's not part of that pattern to my mind. It is a breach with the core principles and beliefs that the government itself wants voters to hold, that it is a government that, that does not um, cover up, that it is a government that does not uh, do things through the back door, that it is not a culture of entitlement. Um, as some of these senators appear to, to believe that it is. Um, for me, there's, there's, there's pre-Senate expenses and then Senate expenses. It's, it's a, a different order of magnitude, as a, or to mix my metaphors, it's a whole new kettle of fish. A whole new kettle of fish. All right, let me read you some comments that Marjorie LeBreton, who was the government's leader in the Senate, made regarding all this just a few days ago, where she said, the reality is that we are facing this crisis because we flung open the door and revealed what was going on, and now, rather than being credited for doing so, we are paying the price for taking this important and necessary step. We are not perfect, but we have conducted ourselves in an appropriate and honorable way. John, do you agree with her comments? I don't agree with her comments. The comments are defensible up to a point. She's right in that the Conservatives brought in new accounting measures and, and new forms of transparency that made it possible for us to uncover the fact that some of the senators, uh, four by the looks of it, um, were, uh, you know, were inappropriately expensing um, in, in different ways, but, but generally inappropriately expensing either travel or living expenses. By the way, 101 of those 105 senators, they were, they, there was no evidence whatsoever of wrongdoing. There's only the evidence of, the, of these four. So far. So, it, so far. But, but that's not fair, Steve. I mean, they've all had to show um, proof of residency, had to, to, to have had their expenses looked at, and there's no question at this point that any other, any other senator is involved. It's just four. Okay. Three conservatives and, and one liberal. And, and sure, the conservatives made it possible for that to be exposed. It doesn't, however, begin... Um, to address the question of why in one case, especially the case of Senator Duffy, the government itself, through its chief of staff, intervened um, to make the problem go away by paying off those expenses. That's the problem that, uh, that Senator LeBreton faces. Uh, I do, however, agree with something else that Senator LeBreton said. I don't know if you're going to refer to it later, but in that speech, she said the Senate is in crisis. And, if this, and if, unless this problem is addressed and fixed, it could bring the Senate down. I have to say, for the first time in my career, I myself am beginning to wonder not whether the government can survive this, but whether the Senate can survive this, because I think there's that much damage that's been done. Well, that's where I want to follow up next, because if you were Tom Mulcair, the NDP leader, or Justin Trudeau, the Liberal leader, uh, or for that matter, or the leader of the Bloc or the leader of the Greens, would you be banging this like a drum in the next election campaign, saying, never mind Senate reform, we got to get rid of this thing altogether, and now is the time? 
Well, uh, uh, Mr. Mulcair has already laid the groundwork for that. He launched a campaign this week. Um, it's not the first time the NDP has done it, but, but certainly the circumstances are different, to advocate for the abolition of the Senate. Um, I have always believed that the notion of abolishing the Senate is just ludicrous, that it can't be done, there's no way for it to be done, and, and anyway, what would you do with the room, uh, which is you know, <laughs> rather nice looking. Um, I would say this week I've started to, to myself to question whether or not, A, this could be an election issue, even though we are two years away, so we need to have some perspective on that, uh, and B, if it is an election issue, whether the question should be, uh, should the Senate be abolished? And, and I want you to think, and your, your viewers to think especially of, of, of this thing. The government originally put forward legislation to reform the Senate, to make senators elected uh, to fixed terms. Uh, that legislation went nowhere. It went nowhere because there were conservative senators themselves who opposed the legislation on the grounds that they had become so indispensable to the body politic that it would be a, a, a tragedy if they were to be removed from office. Your, your after tongue only is in your cheek, years. John. Your tongue is in your in, cheek. As, Firmly planted. Mm -hmm. uh, nonetheless, they managed to get the bill delayed to the point where Stephen Harbour punted it to the Supreme Court. He asked it for a reference. Is it constitutional for the government to make changes to the Senate in this way without first securing the consent of the provinces? There was a second question. The second question was, is it constitutional for the Senate to be abolished? And if it is to be abolished, how should, must it be abolished? What provincial consent is required for that abolition? So if this thing uh, does in fact escalate, if uh, there's a provincial investigation, a police investigation, as I now think is likely, if there are criminal charges laid, uh, as, as, as may well be the case, um, if the Senate ethic, if the, the parliamentary ethics officer produces a report, um, and that report will be forthcoming in the coming months, that is particularly damning, and the government really is up against the wall, once that Supreme Court reference comes down and lays out the groundwork, A, for Senate reform, or B for Senate abolition, I think Stephen Harper might look at the question of abolition. He's never been a great fan of the Senate in the first place. It's, it's hardly his first love. And if it's that dangerous to the government's future, um, and there's that little support for it, abolition is an option that I think did not exist a week ago that does exist today. Hmm. John, I've got about 30 seconds left here, so let me ask you this. I, I forget what it costs to run the Senate every year, but it's more than $100 million, I know that. Would it not be supremely ironic if this body were to come down over 90,000 bucks. It would be beyond ironic. It would be beyond ironic if Mike Duffy, of all people, brought about the abolition of the Senate. I hope it doesn't come to that. I think we need two houses of parliament. Most uh, Westminster democracies, I think New Zealand is the only exception, have two houses of parliament, an upper house and a lower house. The upper house is always problematic. We need to find ways to make it work better. We need to find ways to make it more responsible and more representative. It would be a tragedy, I think, if we actually abolished the thing. It does good work. Right now, there's, a, I think, a bad bill uh, on union disclosure that is before the Senate that the Senate may well um, amend or reject. It's doing its job when it does things like that. I think we'd be the worst for not having it. But this particular scandal brings the future of the Senate very much into doubt. And yes, over $90,000. Hmm. John, always good of you to join us on TVO. Thanks so much, and we'll continue to read you in the Globe and Mail, of course. Pleasure, Steve. Be well. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.